here. Uh, destroy your antelope gun? Yeah. Um, again, the question. <laughs> so, did you think they'd be so iconic when you were working Oh, did on I them? think? Uh, my experience with KISS and what I thought was going to happen was uh, 180 from what actually did happen when uh, Dennis called me, uh, got in contact. Uh, I had no, never seen, never heard of, um, didn't know anything about this world. So it was all a relative mild shock and disbelief. I was, n I was not convinced, but then I, I did not have the privilege of listening to them sing. Um, it was a, a long, it was a little while before we took that photograph in that studio without me holding the foot. So I had never seen them in costume. Uh, all I was looking at were these little uh, slide things, so it was very hard to make a determination. But overall, I didn't have a, a, a positive. I'll be, I did not think, I didn't know what they did, I didn't hear them. They were wearing lipstick, white makeup, long shoes, spandex. I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps and it just didn't, <laughs> didn't jive. But I was quickly uh, reversed because the, when I came back for Love Gun, they were in the, the, the palace that they deserved and uh, you could see that it was quite a success, the world did. Uh, so you were saying that Dennis hired you for that job? Dennis hired me for Destroyer. <laughs> so th what's the pitch, Dennis, that you give to Ken to to paint that album cover? I wanted fantasy art for the cover. We, the agency gave that cover its title, Destroyer. Didn't come from the band. Came from the ad agency. We came up with that. A guy named Vinny worked with me, my friend. He, he made a list of 10 titles and they picked Destroyer off the list. Do you remember what the ten, some of the ten titles were? Other titles? I, I, I was trying to remember some too, some other guy. I don't I, I, like that. I, I, a macho, really killer, killer. macho I remember killer. Zero. Yeah. I remember Zero. So, uh, I wanted to do fantasy art. Uh, the world's greatest fantasy artist is Frank Rosetta at the time. Anybody know who Frank Rosetta is? Uh, yeah, my teacher. A lot of uh. fantasy. Uh, look him up. Yeah. Uh, Conan the Barbarian. A uh, fantastic painter. And he's the guy I knew. And I said, if I can get him to do Kiss, because they, they were like the of marriage to me. Right. Um, and I, I located Frank. I couldn't make a deal with him, to make a long story short. And it is a long story. Right. But uh, I couldn't make a deal with Frank. He wanted too much money. Uh, he wanted a, a piece of the action everywhere for whatever we made out of that artwork. And I said, I can't do that, because I don't know any accountant that's going to want that job. So I said, uh, you know, you got to sell it to me outright. Give me a number. So he gave me a number and it was way up here. So I said, can't do it. So, dejected, forlorn, and drunk, <laughs> I, uh, I took a walk at lunchtime. Uh, our office was uh, 50, <laughs> I was drunk, uh, 55th Street between Park and Madison. I was drunk about every day, basically, but you know, I, I was a good drunk. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't really tell. And. Uh, <laughs> I took a walk to 59th Street between 2nd and 3rd. I knew there was a comic book store there. I said, I'll find another fantasy artist. I had a couple of guys in my mind, but they weren't good enough. I won't tell you who they are. Uh, and I looked at this wall of comics, and I, one of them stuck out, or stu or stood out to me, stuck out. Uh, it was creepy, and it was a, uh, I've told the story before, but I don't mind telling it many times, because. Uh, it was a robot on the cover. He was standing there as though he had just survived some sort of a battle. He had little dents on him, little mist around his feet. And the thing that really got me was uh, the uh, emotion and the paint. And it was painted beautifully. I loved the quality of the, of the painting. So I looked, I said, this guy has talent. I wonder if he could do people. <laughs> you know, this, this is a robot, he's made out of metal. So I, I bought the thing, I brought it back to the office. I, I couldn't read his name, his signature, because he signs it all funny. <laughs> and uh, I called the publisher, I said, I want to hire the guy. I'm an art director for that agency. I want to get the name of the guy who did this cover for Creepy with the thing. And the, uh, the publisher, or whoever it was that I was talking to, said, oh, I'm his agent. And you know, I got a, a bullshit 
uh, meter that's very uh, accurate. <laughs> so I told the guy what he could do with uh, his uh, statement, you know. Uh, I won't use any expletives, but it was very strong. So the guy said, okay, 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 I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So he gave me Ken's number, I called Ken, Ken came in, I said, bring your other artwork, not robots, I want to see people. And I said, I'm, I'm doing an album cover for a band, they're gonna be the biggest band in the world. And I knew it at the time. Wow. I knew it at the time, because Alive had achieved some success. And Alive was the first one I did. Right. Second one was going to be Destroyer, and it was the first one from concept. Do you know what I mean? Alive was a live album. They gave me a photograph, blah, blah, blah. Picture of a live performance. I didn't have to go home and really break my brain about coming up with some sort of a concept. I just had to do a good design and be a good art director, which I did. But Destroyer came from Concept Central. So we got the name for the thing. I, I showed Ken some pictures, if he remembers. I don't know, whatever. Uh, and I said, Ken, they're, they're superheroes, is what they are. Without, without calling themselves that, that's the way I see them. And I stood on the table. <laughs> and he tells me that, Ken, this is what we want. Said, we want them to look like this. Right. So he's up on the table, and I'm down here, and he's talking to me. And he's doing this, and he's doing that, and he's doing that. And I, and I got the idea. And I said, and there's a city in the background being burned into the ground. He said, then there's a city in the background being burned down. Yeah. Easy stuff. Piece of cake. So I directed my ass off. And Ken painted his ass off. So, so what was the band's reaction? Now let me tell you something. When I saw that painting for the first time, it, Ken blew me away. Yeah. Blew me away. I knew, he was, I knew he was pretty good, but I also knew I was taking a big, big chance with him. Right. Because, you know. But I gave him a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> Hoping that that would bring his level up. Dude. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. John, I mean, when you were with the guys, I mean, how how close were you? When, I mean, on tour, obviously, you're with them all the time. What about when you're off tour? Um, how close are you to, I mean, do you communicate with them regularly at that time? or? Oh, yeah. It, it, even though we were home, they're still doing things. And I'm going to be part of whatever they're doing. They're going to go see shows at the garden. They're going to go here. They're going to go there. I'm with them. And uh, it was hard in the beginning because there was only one of me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So we, we always hoped that they'd go together or I'd have to meet them and get everybody in at one time or get up people in and wait for the rest of them to show up. But uh, yeah, it was really pretty close. And, and you know, the office would, would uh, correlate what their movements are supposed to be. And then we hoped that they followed through. Now, how many of those photos of you with like Paul getting out of the car or you walking, how many of those were staged? Um, there's a couple and a couple are random. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there was uh, photographers around a lot of the times that weren't invited, but they'd show up. Yeah. And, you know, we'd have to try to deal with them without stepping on them and keep moving. I think it's interesting we have sort of a, a cross section of Kiss's entire career with you guys. How have you seen their image change from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s? I mean, I would sort of like to hear from all of you, how do you see that the band has changed? There's a progression, but yet they came back around, I think. You know, what they started with, they musically progressed, but then again, where they're at, as far as the show, and, the, and what they're trying to do with it, I think it's back to the beginning, where they're really trying to put something out there for the fans. Yeah, Dennis? You know, fans know and have better opinions about this than I do, but I mean, yeah, I was there, you know, I saw it happening. I think they kind of just went with the times. I mean, you could see the 80s look versus the 70s look, and it was really very much the 80s. You know, when they cut their hair, like the elder pictures and stuff like that? Yeah. And I didn't mind that look. I thought it was okay. You know, I thought they were moving along. Not necessarily forward, but moving along. Can't? <laughs> well, of course, that's what they want. Yeah. But uh, interesting for me talking to fans. Um, I've, I've done a lot of interviews, and a lot of fans ask me a million questions, uh, and most of which I have no answers to. <laughs> right. Uh, but they, they have opinions, and they're all different. I know there are fans who love that Elder era, even love the Elder album. Other fans cannot stand it, and they think it was a big mistake, etc. So, yeah, it's, it's a big potpourri. Ken, how do you see it's changed? 
change. I think everything was positive for them, except when they took the costumes off. I just don't think that worked. I know they gave it their best effort. I don't think that was the direction that the country wanted them to go in, their fans. And they quickly got back into it. And uh, I, I don't see a downtime for Kiss. To me, it was all, it's 40 years of, of brand new rock and roll. They, they brought a, an aspect to rock and roll that wasn't there, the, the actual comic book, Heroes. And they brought an entirely new group of people in that were interested in both rock and roll and comics. So to me, Kiss is a 100% positive uh, growth for the 40 years. Robert? I think my perspective might be a little different because when I first started working with uh, primarily Gene, this was around the Alive 3 era, and there was a lot of things that were very uncertain. But also, it was a time where uh, Gene and Paul were very accessible. I had a pager where Gene would call me multiple times a day, you know, to the point it would, I would laugh with my girlfriend at the time, because like, okay, it's 3 a.m., how long do you think it's gonna be before Gene calls? Sure enough, 12 minutes later, uh, Robert, in the morning, we have to get some carob chip muffins. What? Ch yeah, carob chip. Remind me that we need to get carob chip. Now, this is funny because when I first moved to LA, I'm a New York City kid. I didn't know how to drive. And Gene had just gotten his license. So he's like, I'm gonna pick you up at 6 a.m. We're gonna go get bagels, carrot chip muffins, this kind of thing, and then we're gonna go to my guest house. We're gonna work on history today. I mean, so you can imagine as a KISS fan, being given that kind of a phone call and having your mentor superhero guy pick you up outside your apartment, drive you around. Hey, um, have you ever had In-N-Out Burger? No, Gene. Um, it's a very good, let's, let's try an In-N-Out Burger. I mean, this was the kind of stuff that was happening. I mean, he was, he and I were very close for a while. But then when the um, un, MTV Unplugged thing started happening, things started to change. And I would hear from him literally probably three, four times a week on average until the day came where they sold out Tiger Stadium. I still have all my voicemails and stuff to this day from, that, from those times. And I, I, I'll never forget when he called me, he left a message, Robert, Detroit, Tiger Stadium, sold out, 47 minutes, we're back, click. And it was like, unbelievable. It was like a religious experience. Like all of a sudden, they're back. And, and just that anticipation and being involved in that from a fan's perspective. I saw the Revenge Alive 3 era kiss evolve into the reunion kiss, and it was a very, very different era. And Lynn, what do you think? How has the band changed over the years? I think instead of me saying how the band has changed, um, for the book, I interviewed Gene and Paul because I wanted you all to have original quotes. So I'm going to read you something now from Paul, which totally addresses this question. Yeah. After we did the solo albums, we decided to each use the color of the aura that was on each of our albums. Mine was purple. It was all wrong. We went off the rails for quite a while. It felt right at the time, but looking back, we were lost. In that moment, we didn't realize we had given up our hunger and our edge. We were becoming more concerned in attracting a larger following. It was calculated in sanitizing who we were. We were on the verge of becoming a Vegas act. What had started off as a rebellion of exerting our autonomy and difference from everyone else morphed into being more concerned with public opinion. We forgot why we started doing what we did. We lost our teeth. We were more complacent, comfortable with success at the expense of what made us successful. Paul. Nice. Wow. Very nice. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Anybody? Yeah. I got one for Lynn. Digital or the old days in the 70s with Phil? <laughs> he says digital, digital or the old days with Phil. Especially, Why? I mean, when I, when I put this book together for KISS, because, you know, first of all, they didn't have the lighting that they have now, the amount of light coming at you. But in those days, 
uh, uh, to shoot action. I loved photographing kids.